Welcome everybody into the Mind Sculptors gameplay series. We've got a great matchup lined up for you here on this New Year's Day, the first day of 2021. Thank you for joining us and stopping in. Um, up today, we do have, uh, she was on last week for Christmas. We had her back this week. She's part of Mental Misplay. Um, it is the, the legend, Rebel. Uh, she is going to be playing her Tevish Doom Scramble deck. Um, with her is her uh, friend from the Ramp Gang uh, Mental Misplay. That whole group is Alan. He's going to be playing his Mirin uh, kind of mid-range list, uh, which is uh, actually, I believe, uh, on some sort of necrotic ooze when con. Also in the game is the madman himself, Cobblepot on Advantage Wheel Thieves. Uh, his sort of take on the wheels deck uh, with sort of an advantage Thrasios uh, spin on it as well. And our good friend Spleenface over from Into the North. And I mean, I guess he's part of the Mind Sculptors as well. Uh, our good friend Spleenface is going to be playing Calamax the Storm Rise, uh, that combo deck. I'm Callahan. I'm joined today uh, by Pongo. And Pongo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited to watch this game. Yeah, um, I am too, and I'm really hoping this will set a good tone for the for the year moving forward, right? Like, I, I hope this this sets the new year off on 2021 in a good good way. Yeah, 2020 was tough, and we certainly need 2021 to be a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> the best it can be. Yeah. Um. So let's uh, go into some of these lists here. Uh, we'll start off. Uh, with Rebel, she's playing this Tevish Krom Doom Scramble list, and so for some of the people who might not be uh, very familiar with what it is, this this deck is based around a card called Reality Scramble, and uh, just kind of give us a, an idea of what uh, this list is trying to do. Sure. So um, in a lot of respects, this is kind of like a Grixis Turbo Nas deck. Um, you know, you see a lot of the usual suspects, you know, notably Krom in the command zone. Uh, what's interesting is we have Tevesh Sot, and I'll get to that in a moment. Although he's a very powerful card in the zone, and you certainly, uh, you know, you should definitely give him another look if you haven't already. Um, you know, looking at the deck itself, we're talking about you know your ritual package like Rite of Flame, Jessica's Will. Um, you know, even going deep into like Final Fortune, um, and naturally we're playing all the fast mana rocks uh, and Underworld Breach. Now, where this deck differs from your sort of like traditional. Um, like Turbo Nas, Grixis deck, is that uh, we're deciding not to play Dockside Extortionist. Um, <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, uh, we're not playing Dockside Extortionist. And in its play, uh, the deck is running Sire of Insanity and is going to be leaning on Tevish Zat and Krom to kind of like break parity on the Sire of Insanity effect uh, by, you know, letting you draw additional cards on your own turn. Um, well, where, where everyone is running, kind of running hellbent, um, and you just try to pull ahead that way. Uh, and how are we putting this sire of insanity into play? Well, <laughs> certainly, you know, you can hard cast it. That's definitely an option. This deck generates tons and tons of mana. Um, you know, that's not the cool way of doing that's it. Though. Certainly not the cool way of doing it. No, the cool way of doing it is uh, through one of two different cards. So the first one of these is reweave. Um. So Reweave is basically like a transmutation type effect uh, where like you take a permanent that you control and you sacrifice it and then you kind of start revealing cards off the top of your deck until you reveal a card with the same type um, with that shares a card type. Uh, so in this case, because this deck is only running Sire of Insanity and is not running things like Dockside Extortionist, um, you're going to try to sacrifice like your Krom um, in order to either put a Sire of Insanity into play, or alternatively, you can sacrifice Tevish Zat um, to put Jace Wielder of Mysteries into play to combo with, you know, your uh, Demonic Consultation type lines. Um, you know, you could even sacrifice one of your Thralls that Tevish Zat puts into play, which I think is a lot of the time going to work out pretty well for you because Sire of Insanity, when it comes <laughs> down, and, you know, you've got Tevish Zat in play and you've got Krom in play, uh tends to kind of just, you know, control the game. <laughs> Everyone being held Very accurate. And, and only getting one card a turn uh, certainly 
lets things work in your favor a lot more. Um, you know, everyone kind of has to get lucky from that point onward uh, in order to break out of that. And, you know, you're going to just tend to get a little bit luckier because, you know, you're playing Grixis and because you're playing two really powerful draw engines. Um, and then finally, you know, you have one additional sort of powerful line you can take, which is, uh, you know, in a pinch, if you happen to have like a Mystic Remora in play or a Ristic Study in play, you can try to uh, reweave into an Underworld Breach and take Underworld, you know, your classic Underworld Breach lines. Um, what's really cool about this deck, you know, other than being kind of otherwise powerful uh, Turbo Grixis deck, is uh, Reality Scramble, because of the retrace ability, it kind of gives you like a lot of play into counter spells where as long as you have like some lands in hand, you kind of have the opportunity to threaten that line repeatedly if people's interaction for you is counter spells specifically and not removal. Um, so that kind of gives you this like really interesting recurring threat in that respect. So I, th I think this is a really sweet deck. Um, you know, kudos to Rebel for brewing it, and I'm excited to see it in action. Yeah, um, I am excited to see it as well. Um, this is, uh, I, I well, I did get to play against this uh, when Phoenix and I were on Mental Misplay, um, and it, it, I can confirm, it is a very interesting deck. Uh, it does a lot of those Turbo Nas things. It's really cool. Um, one of the cards I tell you to look out for is Do Not Sleep on the Mnemonic Betrayal. It is a very good card. Um, up next, uh, also from Mental Misplay in the Ramp Gang, is uh, Alan. He's going to be playing Marin of Clan Nell Toth. And like I said in the opener, this is in the classic Necrotic Ooze deck. So what for those of people who might not be familiar, what is this deck doing? Uh, well, it seems like it's breaking parity on Sire of Insanity pretty well, first of all. But um, <laughs> second of all, what this deck is sort of trying to do otherwise is uh, to kind of play this like mid-range black-green type strategy, uh, typically throwing down, you know, some amount of stacks effects, um, you know, some amount of uh, control effects. Um, and at that point, you know, once it's kind of gained a little bit of tempo on its opponents who are kind of scrambling to try to answer something, um, it's going to try to either win with a Protean Hulk line, uh, so a reanimated Protean Hulk sacrifice to a sacrifice outlet, uh, or else it's going to try to do some kind of uh, um, buried alive pile. Uh, and so this is a really interesting deck in the sense that it's playing really kind of old tech. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people have sort of by and large moved away from, from buried alive. Uh, because three mana is a little bit clunky and because uh, the buried alive piles tend to not be of like the highest card quality that being said Marin what she does is she gives you like an incredible amount of um, resiliency on those plans anything revolving around the graveyard you know if people are trying to interact with destroy removal or counter spells if she can come down she can bring it back into play and so what that means is that it sort of gives you a certain degree of inevitability. You know, your opponents mm -hmm. are just going to kind of have to answer it repeatedly, and, you know, you just hope to get there at some point. Right. Well, and one of the things, too, uh, that I think is very interesting with this list uh, is that with the meta after the flash ban shifting away from as playing as much graveyard hate as it used to, um, this deck is much more well positioned now than it was, you know, a year ago. Um, so I'm very interested to see how this goes. This is, of course, Alan's, uh, everybody knows Alan for this list. Um, he did a, um, greedy keeps episode with, uh, Braden on CDH cast about it. So you can go check that out, uh, there up next is, uh, we're on to the Sculpty Boys now. Um, and so we've got uh, Cobblepot playing Thrasios and Vile Smasher. And this is his Hull Breacher, Notion Thief, the uh, better known as, you know, this this Wheel Thieves list. Um, a lot of people would know it kind of as Opus Thief uh, generally. Um, but this is the green version of it. Um, so what is this list really trying to do? You know, I have to say I kind of can't really believe my eyes. It's it's a weird day when Cobblepot is playing kind of the most <laughs> typical deck at the table. 
Um, which is not to say that, you know, there's nothing spicy about this deck, but certainly it shares a lot with kind of these uh, four color sort of mid rangey pile type decks uh, that uh, are extremely popular and extremely powerful uh, within the current CEDH climate. Um, so what this deck does differently from the sort of like, let's say, turbo-ish deck, you know, Grixis plus green type shell is that it's playing more of that advantage game as you were talking about. Uh, so, you know, we see the inclusion of Seedborn Muse. That's kind of this obvious tell that this deck is going to try to uh, have some more late game potential than a lot of the decks that are trying to turbo out wins. Um, but, you know, where that type of strategy would typically have been done in Thrasios Timna, uh, this deck basically says, well, you know, as good as Timna is, um, <laughs> red is just better than Timna <laughs> and, and the white cards that you get. You know, I don't, you know, We'll, we'll save that discussion for another day. Uh, I, I do yeah. certainly think that you get a lot out of red here, but uh, you know the inclusion of things like Sylvan Library and the inclusion of things like Seedborn Muse uh, implies that you know we're again playing that sort of more mid rangey deck. Uh, and then what this deck is really trying to do in terms of uh, disrupting and winning the game uh, is getting one of the sort of draw disruption stacks pieces into play so you know your narset your hull breach or your notion thief mm -hmm. and combining that with a wheel effect so that's sort of like the big a plus b strategy of the deck in the sense that there's a good amount of redundancy for all of those effects now we have i think like three of those wheel hating effects that you can play in yeah. uh, in sans white and then you've got you know three wheels equally that you can easily jam into pretty much any fast deck uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of redundancy there, and that's a very, very powerful combo that I think catapults you massively ahead no matter what, and then it becomes kind of trivial, I think, from that point to actually win the game with your, your Thassa's Oracle type win condition and your grind, your right. powerful grind engines. Right. Um, and it is important to note, uh, you, you said the discussion about this for another day. Uh, I will drop a little bit of a teaser. Uh, our new podcast episode will be coming out uh, this Monday, January 4th. And we are actually going to be talking about specifically uh, these Wheel Thieves lists. Um, and that's going to feature myself, Cobblepot, Spleenface, and Phoenix. Uh, speaking of Spleenface, uh, he is playing probably... I don't know that he's playing the most bizarre deck at the table, but he's certainly uh, competing for it. Uh, he is playing Calamax the Storm Sire, and uh, he calls this list one punch. Um, so <laughs> explain to me how this deck is going to try and win in one punch. Um, so there's a few different ways that this deck can win in one punch, um, which is why I particularly like the name. Although it, it, it might be best to describe sort of the Kiki lines as like a series of con consecutive normal punches rather than one punch <laughs> uh so but you know the, the one punch line that you can take that's not the kiki line here is uh if you have uh calmax in play and calmax is attacking uh if you are sorry not if calmax is attacking if, if you have calmax in play um and you can tap him then what you can do is you can get an infinitely large calmax by first playing a sorcery spell um and then casting uh, an instant clone sort of effect copy effect um which will be your first instant for the turn cal max will copy that um which gives you two copy effects on the stack you can use your second copy effect to target your first copy effect and get infinite copies of you know the sorcery that you put on the stack um which means that you're going to get infinite copies and whenever you copy an instant spell you put a plus one plus one counter on Calamax, so you get an infinitely large Calamax. So that's going to be one way that you're going to make essentially an arbitrarily large Calamax that you can use for the the, the, the punchy punchies. Uh, and <laughs> if if the sorcery that you happen to be using happens to be Graphitic Punch, then then you're definitely winning in one punch. Because what Gravitic Punch says is target creature you control deals uh, deals damage, excuse me, equal to its power to target player. So, you know, if you've already made your Calamax super huge and you happen to be uh, copying the Gravitic Punch, then you're taking out two opponents right on the spot. Uh, and then, you know, you can theoretically just jumpstart it later and, and take out the third opponent. Um, but alternatively, uh, you know, Calamax also has the series of consecutive normal punches uh, line where, you know, sort of the more classic Calamax line 
where you get a tapped cowl max and then you play a court of calling uh, and you copy that court of calling. It has to be a pretty big court of calling. You know, exit has to be five. Uh, but, you know, Cal Max can be tapped to the Court of Calling, so, you know, he at least discounts it on that front. Uh, and then you get Course of Recruiter and Kiki Jiki, or, you know, some other Kiki Bottom, um, and you essentially make infinite um, hasty attackers, and, and that's one possible way that you can win the game right there. Uh, otherwise, this is, you know, in many respects, a typical team your sort of mid rangey type deck with, like, you know, a lot of a uh, good ramp, uh, some good value uh, spells and, and uh, creatures and cards. And uh, yeah, otherwise, you know, other than like the sort of commander-centric type lines, that's uh, that's what you've got going on here. Awesome. It's a, it's a very, it, it, it kind of feels very um, like a better Riku deck almost to me. Yeah. Um, well, to be fair, though, like the bar was not incredibly high for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, uh, we're gonna start off. Our turn order goes: uh, Allen in first, second seat is Cobblepot, third is Rebel, and fourth is uh, Spleenface. Unfortunately, um, Allen starts us off here. He kept a seven-card opening hand. He got a Twilight Mire, a Misty Rainforest, a Mana Crypt a Carpet of Flowers, an Allosaurus Shepherd, a Caustic Caterpillar, and a Skull Clamp. Uh, Pongo, what do you think of that opening set? There's there's a lot to like here, I think. Um, I, I'm really hoping that Alan manages to draw another land, otherwise that Twilight Mire end up be, might end up being really awkward. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, like, a hand with Carpet of Flowers and Mana Crypt is very often going to be good, and while, you know, the biggest sort of issue with his hand is that Alan doesn't really have any way to disrupt other people at the table. He is going first. That certainly mitigates that to a large extent. And, you know, he's really, really well set up to go into a longer game, a grindier game, uh, thanks to Skull Clamp and, you know, two kind of imminently Skull Clampable creatures. Uh, so, right. you know, those are very, very powerful to have just in play. You know, Costa Caterpillar can be a piece of disruption here in theory. Uh, but in addition, you know, combined with Marin and you know, them being 1-1s one and, you know, one-mana creatures that Marin can bring back right away. Uh, yeah, th there's certainly a lot to like here. You know, if you can get that whole engine going, you have, if you get enough time to do that, I think the game is looking pretty good for you. Absolutely. Uh, up next, like we said, is Cobblepot. He also kept a seven-card hand. He kept a Wooded Foothills, a Flooded Strand, an Arbor Elf, Fierce Guardianship, Pyroblast, a Mana Drain, and a Wheel of Fortune. So how do you feel about this starting set? This is a really interesting set, and it kind of um, speaks to some of the awkwardness uh, with wheels and mana, and sort of like mana dorky strategies. Not mana dorks necessarily, but like the type of strategies that a lot of mana dork decks are uh, playing these days, which is, you know, you're going for sort of this mulligan stability uh, because you have a high density of turn one ramp uh, and then you're trying to keep a like kind of a lot of seven card hands um, and this one is very very powerful you know you have a lot of interaction here and you've got you know free interaction essentially starting on turn two uh, assuming Thrasios comes down there or file smasher comes down there uh, and you know going forward you're going to have the ability to hold up multiple pieces of interaction but you know this entire time this wheel is starting to kind of rot away in your hand it feels a little awkward if that's mm -hmm. the game you want to you want to play it's also theoretically possible that, uh, you know, you just wheel away this hand and, you know, other than Arbor Elf um, and the Fierce Guardianship, you know, there's there's not much to talk about here. Uh, that's that's right. certainly another line you can take. Uh, but I guess, you know, we're going to have to see where Cobble decides he's sort of positioned in this game. Does he need to take a more aggressive slant or does he need to take more of a grindy slant? And I think the Wheel of Fortune is the card to look at. If he fires that off early, it probably implies that he thinks he needs to play more aggressively. And, and it, it is kind of awkward too, though, to be fair, because the Arbor Elf does kind of limit what lands he can fetch early. Yeah, certainly. Um, that being said, I would not be surprised to, you know, see perhaps uh, like a, a, I guess this is one of those rare situations where like you might want to get the uh, tropical island with the wooded foothills just because, you know, Mana Drain being double blue. 
Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a lot of situations, uh, you're going to not necessarily want to get that tropical island just because uh, then if uh, Flooded Strand needs to get like an underground sea, you're not hitting your red mana. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. I I, I think certainly it'll be interesting to see what Cobblepot fetches here just because like there is some awkwardness there with the mana drain uh, and and the potential for wanting to cast uh, Thrasios and and do other things here and and have the double blue. Absolutely. On to our uh, next player at the table. It is Rebel. Um, She also kept a seven card hand. So far, three of our first seven, or of our four have kept seven card hands. Um, She kept a miscast, a jeweled lotus, a fierce guardianship, Rhystic Study, Mana Crypt, Dark Ritual, and City of Brass. Um, so I would assume we're going to see Tevish, Zat, or uh, Krom pretty quick, huh? Yes, 100%. <laughs> um, this is kind of like the nuts in a lot of respects. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that this is an embarrassment of riches. Um, so yeah, you're certainly casting one of your commanders, you know, potentially as early as turn one. Uh, you know, you maybe you get down that mana crypt on turn one instead. Uh, you have like a large amount of options here. Um, and yeah, you, there's nothing, nothing wrong with this hand. It's, it's very good. It is a good seven. Um, up next, uh, in the fir- in the, uh, going last at the table. Well, look at that. All four of them kept seven card hands. Spleen kept a birds of paradise, a pyroblast, an earthcraft, deflecting swat, an island, three visits, and verdant catacombs. Um, so what do you think of this seven? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, we're kind of seeing what we talk about a lot in this podcast, which is the green decks tend to, (laughs) um, not necessarily always get the nuts, but you know, Rebel, in in Rebel's case, she, she managed to get it in seven, which is, which is, which is lovely. Um, you know, we're not all always that lucky, unfortunately, but Morgan, you know, being sort of playing the prototypical green deck here is keeping a very kind of stable seven card hand with mana dorks uh mana dork uh and three visits i should say and you know even earthcraft so potentially gonna get a lot of mana to be able to cast the dude here uh earthcraft means that you get to tap it right away um so you know there's certainly a lot to like here you have a couple pieces of interaction uh but what it's really missing is like some kind of uh you know, pay off or, or a big value piece. So Morgan is definitely, uh, Spleenface is definitely hoping to draw into a, a tutor or, um, you know, some kind of uh, copy effect and, and hope to nail somebody else's tutor effect, something like that. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're going to quick take a quick timeout and we'll be right back with the start of this first game. Welcome back, everybody, and uh, I'm Callahan, joined again by uh, my good friend Pongo here, and uh, we are getting ready here for the start of our uh, first game. We do have two games lined up for you with this crew and these deck lists. Um, So going first is going to be uh, Mirren here. And yep. they are going to be to be doing uh, some of these interesting things. So with this hand, what are you what are you expecting this opening to be? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I think probably you want to actually um, slow roll the carpet of flowers here, just in case, like for whatever reason, people decide not to sequence their islands first. Um, you know, it's it's oh. kind of interesting because there's multiple decks here with wheels so you do have some consideration for wanting to jam out the mana crypt early and the carpet of flowers if you're just trying to develop your mana alternatively we might see a allosaurus shepherd here or a caterpillar if you think you need a disruption early on yeah well he does play the misty rainforest and he fetches a bayou um as as we would so we'll see what he's getting here yeah, that seems like the correct... But playing Twilight Mire seems really bad right now. <laughs> yeah. 
So those lands, like, they're they're they can be really powerful in the right situation, or they can just absolutely lose you the game in other situations. Like, so I don't know how I feel about them in two colors. I feel like your fixing is often good enough such that you don't need to run them. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I couldn't fault someone for for oh playing boy. them. Mana Crypt comes down. All right. I, I like this. I think that the life total doesn't matter a whole lot when you're playing this deck and, you know, you want to not get wheeled. All right, so we have the Caterpillar out. Yeah. And the Skull Clamp. Yeah. Apologize okay. for the the delay there. Skull Clamp comes down, attaches onto the Caterpillar, and he's going to draw some cards. All right, we're, imme- we're immediately going for two cards. This seems this seems acceptable. I think, uh, I think definitely trying to dig for... Uh, like a stacks piece here a more impactful stacks piece makes a lot of sense so i like this play it's gone the cost of caterpillar is gone but it's not for, forgotten in this deck wooded foothills f- absolutely i mean and it can very quickly come back uh considering that mirin um can get all of that stuff back very yeah. quickly um yep. it's still it's still in his hand throws <laughs> down a yeah absolutely um, Cobblepot throws down a wooded foothills. He does get the tropical right. island. Yeah. So the awkward part is that this doesn't contribute to casting Vile Smasher, but Vile Smasher is not that important anyway. So this is less of a concern in um, Thrasio's file than in Thrasio's Tim and I, I think, where you're much more likely to actively want to be casting right. both of your commanders. Well, and, and also with this being a wheels deck instead of, and there's the Arbor Elf, um, which seems correct. Uh, with this not being a, you know, curiosity deck, it makes a lot more sense to to not be as hard in on the Vile Smasher. Right. We which do is, get the City of Brass from yeah. Rebel. All right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> and it has begun. Jeweled Lotus from Rebel. Uh, uh, Lotus and pedal. we got a Lotus Petal, because why not? That's a top deck. This makes the the turn really disgusting. Dark ritual there. So we're um, up to three black. Oh boy! Cracks the jeweled lotus. Yeah. For black, Tevish Zat is Tevish Zat has and, entered the chat. And and we're playing the Ristic study. And I'm sure Morgan is going to call an emergency. That meeting is here. really good. Alan, Alan, that's my kind of party. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes well, ahead and passes after creating here. the two thralls. Yeah, he is very quiet. Uh, this is this is not great for the rest of the table. Um. No, no, this is uh, this is certainly very, very rough. Oh, he's salty. That is important. She is down to two cards, but a rhystic study. What'd you say? He, I, we heard a little bit of salt there. Morgan saying she she cast nine mana worth of oh. spells on, on turn one. Ten mana worth of spells. Important important to oh clarify. All right. So we're going to get... I guess we're probably yeah, guess still going to see the mana the, right here. The dark grit. Yeah. We're, we're, we're probably still seeing the Birds of Paradise so here just because Morgan can't avoid to uh, be so behind at this point. Yeah, and, and there's, it's very interesting to have the person going third that far ahead than the rest of the table. Yes and no. So, I mean, like, it's more unusual that Rebel had, like, a seven-card hand that did all of this. It's, right. It's, you know, if you have a five-card hand and, like, you're not also getting the Ristic Study and the Tevish Sot, like, that's pretty consistent. You can certainly do that in Grixis. But, you know, getting the Stone Cold Nuts, like, you know, we all want to get that <laughs> every time. But, it, it, you know, it doesn't doesn't work that way in real in life. In fact, you have gotten those, haven't you? Yes, I think famously you on this You are very famously channel. on our channel. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So here I imagine, um, you know, we might see the Carpet of Flowers. Um 
Okay, so we, we found another land. That's great. So we see a wooded uh, foothills. Yeah, we, we do have an yeah. island in place, so the carpet of flowers certainly gets there now. And hopefully Alan found... Uh, I think he's getting like an overgrown or something. Tomb. Although that's very awkward here, even though it feels somewhat necessary. Overgrown tomb um, does tick him down to 33 life. Um, so he is kind of having to aggressively go against his life total there. Um, but you kind of have to do that in this situation uh, with how far ahead Rebel is. Yeah, so your life total is not incredibly relevant here because you're not playing ad nauseum and two of your opponents are. So the aggro is going everywhere right. else in, in almost every situation. We, we could see Marin come down here. Um, I would love to see like a Trinisphere type effect. Um, Collector Roof might be too awkward to want to actually play, at least until after you've uh, developed a little bit more. All right. What'll it be? So he's sitting there thinking, um, and you know, uh, you know, while we take this time, I do want to remind you: uh, this was, this is uh, the the game here uh, for our New York New Year's Day. And uh, if you enjoy the content that we are producing here in gameplay and also in the podcast that we do, uh, make sure to go check out our Patreon. And uh, there you get all sorts of different uh, things, including some behind the scenes games uh, where you can see us just kind of hanging out, playing um, in in those sorts of things. Carpet of Flowers does come down on uh, Air Alan's side of the board. Yeah, the, the awkward part of this is the Ristic study, but I think you kind of are forced into it. And this is one of those situations where I think, um, you know, Rebel is so massively ahead that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You right. know, like if you decide not to feed this Rhystic <laughs> study, you're just going to lose to, um, you know, her enormous value engine that she already has in play. Uh, right. You know, alternatively, you know, you'll you'll just feed her too many cards and she'll win that way. So... Right. Flooded strand it, from Cobble. And it is important to point out that for for Rebel, I mean, she was down to two cards. She's almost she's up to five. She's almost refilled her hand entirely. Yeah. I mean, Rhystic Study drawing what three cards? We'll we'll do that. And but imagine here, we're gonna see it draw more cards. Here um, I, I feel like Cobble has to play Thrasios. Volcanic Island from yeah. Cobblepot. Um, so, so he seems to be thinking about a wheel, I would assume. Well, that's certainly possible, but I don't know that that's actually how you're going to win this game. I mean, like, the problem is that you're, you're kind of filling Rebel's graveyard. I mean, you are filling your graveyard, which you like. Um, you're filling a lot of people's graveyards here. But... You know, Rebel is already so ahead here that I feel like you do need to play some defense. Yeah. Pyroblast on the Rhystic Study. This this is Not a reasonable for the play. study. This is reasonable. Yeah. Um, and, and then I imagine we see Thrasios coming down in order to represent the uh, Fierce Guardianship. And as well as develop. It's very interesting. I mean, I think Morgan might have said this uh, in the in the game chat, but it's, you know, that Rhystic study ended up being three mana refill your hand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which is very powerful. But, uh, you know, you might be able to stem the bleeding here to some extent. In theory, what you could have also done is just hold up the Pyroblast as interaction. Uh, but, you know, this, this kind of lets you and develop the without theoretically feeding rebel quite as many cards you know i i like destroying the rhystic study here just because like you yep. anticipate that this game should hopefully go longer all right so rebel doesn't take damage off the crypt 
Um, so let's see what she has. Uh, she she drew a lot of cards. So let's see if she drew anything good. Um, and she can potentially draw even more cards uh, by sacrificing one of those thralls. Uh, it draws her what two cards off of a sacrifice of a normal, no, just a normal creature yeah. and three off of a commander. Yeah, it's like pretty nutty. It's like it's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, you know, it is. For, is, for is it is commander. a good card. Yeah, you expect your five mana cards to be pretty strong, so it's not overpowered or anything. But yeah. It is a very powerful value engine. She does uptick and sack a thrall. The the crazy thing to me is that they're both upticks. So um, and with one down tick. So that's how you have to design planeswalkers for commander. Um, it, uh, like specifically, I think ones that you you want people to play as commanders. I think they need to have a higher casting cost, and they need to gain loyalty uh, more easily than you might uh, design a commander to do for like standard, let's say, or for, for legacy or for modern um, right. because they kind of like need to generate value and they kind of need to stick around. Uh, and you've got three opponents all trying to, to gun it down. So like they need to be beefier. Absolutely. So we did get an demonic consultation. I missed what it was naming. Um, she did calling the week, a thrall, Cast a demonic, uh, de excuse me, cast calling the weak and hit a uh, demonic consultation off of it. And we're naming ad nauseum, which uh, think, yeah, rebel is not correct. just dead here. We'll see uh, where she ends up. Okay. All right. That was a pretty successful. Okay, that's actually a pretty good. That was a successful um, demonic consultation. That is, as far as demonic consultations go, probably one of the 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 not worst ones I've ever seen. She did lose some pretty big cards, um, but I don't think that that hurts as bad um, as it could have been. No, um, and it, it feels like she didn't even lose all that many of her rituals either. Um, what's a bit awkward is that it might be a bit harder to get there from a zero mana main phase Nas with no land drop just because yeah, you exiled a lot of your fast mana here. That's that makes it really rough. Now it is zero. It isn't zero mana. It would just be one mana to be fair. She does have the city of brass untapped. Right, right. So ad Nas is getting cast. So let's see what she is getting. Oh, uh, Cobblepot has a response. Fierce guardianship. And we see a miscast in response. Oh, She oh. has a fierce guardianship of her own. Okay, well, Rebel also... Oh, Rebel, yeah. Rebel had the fierce guardianship in her opener. That's true. Um, and has the miscast, potentially. Jeez. All right, All right let's see uh, if she can get there, despite having lost a lot of fast mana. She's, she's um, even saying that this is a really rough main phase <laughs> uh, Nas deck and losing a lot of your rituals I, I just doesn't help. She did hit a Jessica as well, so it, 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 that could help if she can get some fast mana. Um, not a lot of fast mana I'm seeing. I do apologize for some of the video issues that we are having. Um, LED does get hit off of that. That could be very helpful. Certainly with the Mox Opal Final Fortune... Well. Wait, was a miscast revealed off of the Adnos? Because was didn't Rebel have um, a miscast in her opener? I think so. Huh? Interesting. Well, I would expect this to be one of those situations where when you're putting your deck together, you know, like you're you're building it based on the list that you made online. And like you're like, what is this yeah. last card that I'm missing? Oh, it's miscast. And so you put in a miscast, you know, and, and kind of just missed that it wasn't miscast that you were missing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I that has certainly happened to me. Interesting. And I've I've seen it happen to to other people. I think famously that happened to um to Bill, 
from the spike feeders where i think he had multiple copies <laughs> of demonic tutor in his deck um <laughs> which which is uh a little bit better than multiple copies That's of awkward. miscast <laughs> <laughs> So she is at five life. And it is important to note she does have a final fortune in hand. Um, Mox Opal comes down. LED comes down. Uh, she is now representing five mana, although three of that requires her to drop her hand. Yeah, the, the final fortune makes this pretty easy. Yeah. Yep. Casting final fortune here. This is why we play final fortune. That card... Um, is quite good and i feel like you were some of the you were kind of pioneering that uh, a little bit there i felt like uh, a few months ago um so i wouldn't say that i feel like a lot of people have have messed around with final fortune in a wide variety of contexts especially in more turbo nas contexts um so i i actually like stole that technology from those decks um and what I did was try it in a kind of like hybrid mid rangey sort of like faster mid rangey shell. It's not like a, like a all in fast deck. We're talking about experimental Najila here um, just for context, but it's more that final fortune is like the type of ad enabler that can contribute also to the Najila plan, like the basic Najila plan where in a lot of situations, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you have an extra turn where you get to swing in with Najila, you get to um, then have enough warriors to win with Derevi or to win with Nature's Will. So it, it kind of is, serves a dual purpose there. You know, it's a very risky, like, time walk. Um, and time walk is power, right? Uh, so mm-hmm. the thinking here is that, like, especially with, like, Jeweled Lotus in the format, especially with the format, you know, going faster, kind of like what we're seeing on, on screen right now, um, you know, even mid-range decks c- can kind of look to see, you know, in what places can we start going faster, uh, even if it's potentially a little bit more all-in. Um, because, you know, right. if, if a lot of people are playing all-in decks, like, you're not necessarily going to get punished for being a little bit more all-in yourself. Um, you know, everyone is kind of just trying to get there as quickly as possible, and as such, like, uh, you know, people are skimping on some some amount of interaction, and you know, people are getting interacted with earlier and capitalizing on those opportunities to win, you know, when people either tap out, you know, to play aggressively or like somebody makes a really aggressive mm-hmm. win attempt and gets stopped and you're next in turn order. Um, you know, those are the types of things that I'm kind of thinking about when I'm building my sort of uh, my decks these days. My, my To be, to be clear, like my decks for blind metas because um, or, or very specific metas. But, you know, if if I have like a a meta that is like sort of more mid rangey and it's like my play group that I'm consistently playing with, then, you know, maybe I'm not playing something like Final Fortune. Maybe in that case, like I'm going to be happier playing something like a Timna in that slot and just being able to grind a little bit more value without necessarily being all in. But, uh, you know, these are the types of things that we evaluate as potential tech options. Uh, over in the Najila Discord, and, and that I like to do as uh, just you know part of my own edification and deck building. <laughs> um, so she is going over to her second turn. Did not uh, lose life off the uh, mana crypt. That's and pretty helpful because <laughs> that was gonna be awkward. Yeah, if she had, but uh, no, I think. Most seven card hands off that Nas should hopefully get you there. And she's casting Jessica's Will. Uh, Spleen has six cards in hand. Um, so she just hit a Chromox, which could be pretty okay, maybe. Yeah. Um, um, those All those rocks seem like they could potentially be useful. Um, she did play City of Traders for land for turn. And she also has uh, Yogg's Will available for her as well. Yeah. Has six red mana floating. It, it feels very trivial to win when you have a Yogg's Will after an Adnaz. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you've gotten this far, then you know that nobody has anything because, you know, short of, like, specifically Noxious Revival, 
um, which is not going to be enough in this spot. Right. Yeah, I think the 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 only interaction that we were going to see uh, this turn was really going to be Cobble on the fierce guardianship, and she just had the answer. Yeah, and I mean, so that's how a lot of these Grixis decks like try to exploit the more mid rangey meta. Uh, if you can get under the mid range decks by winning on turn two, and they don't have their free counter magic, or they didn't ramp into, you know, like their value engine or their mana dork plus one mana interaction, um, then you're just going to kind of take the win out from under them. Right. So let's we're see. talking about Praetor's Grasp here, I think. Oh, yeah. That might be the way to win, although because of the Yogg's Will, um, you can't cast it repeatedly. Yeah, that's certainly a bit of a, a non-bow between those two cards, but they're both so powerful that you run both of them anyway. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think... I mean, here you would probably want to steal a Thassa's Oracle from somebody, right? Like, if you're stealing anything. That's probably the way you would go, right? Like, Praetor's Grasp, grab a Thor, and then cast your Demonic Consultation again. Yeah. Um, that That's, like, one of the cleanest ways you can win in this spot. But I don't know that the uh, Yawgmoth... Has the Yawgmoth's Will been cast already? It has been. Okay, cast, so this yes. is the second lotus. So petal she's currently. Oh yeah, the lotus yeah, petal. And back she is casting. Way. Yeah, uh, and she is cast. She casts like uh, demonic or uh, dark. Uh, what is it? Dark ritual, demonic consultate or uh, calling the weak, sacking a thrall. Yeah, she she just decided not to crack the LED in response to uh, the Yogmoth's will, which, considering, you're holding miscast feels like. That's acceptable, um, especially when you've got all that Jessica's will mana, and you know I think like you're not really hurting for colored mana too too much. <laughs> all right, so we are targeting cobble, targeting Cobblepot for Thassa's Oracle, and uh, correct, and and Rebel is saying, "Am I getting pranked here?" Nope, no, no, you're not, <laughs> Rebel. You know the concern would have been Cobblepot having it in his his hand. I think. Yeah, that that would have been a rip. Um, but otherwise, I think it doesn't matter. All right, so um, so all of those cards should be going into exile. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, she has the pile in front of her. That's the the graveyard. Yeah, there's a big thick exile pile and a big thick graveyard. <laughs> Yep, and she's casting the consultation in response to the Thassa's Oracle, and uh, the table does not have a response, which we kind of already knew. Um, so with this game um, and what's going on here, um, what do you think was kind of the pivotal, like the turning point um, where this could have been avoided, but possibly not? Uh, well, to a large extent, I feel like this game was over on turn zero. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like it may have been decided in mulligans. That being said, Rebel drawing the Lotus Petal on turn one, uh, because as far as I remember, she didn't have that in her opener. So she did not. Yeah, I think that may be, may have been the turning point actually, because then you're developing Tevesh Sat and Ristic Study, um, you know, essentially casting 10 mana worth of spells on turn one. And like, that's, that's insane. Um, you know, no, no <laughs> one can, can really argue with that, how insane that is. You know, that's, um, you know, that's essentially like right up there with me casting, uh, pure into the abyss on turn one. Uh, right. I think that, it, you know, I did cast 10 mana worth of spells getting to the pier. <laughs> um, and you know, and then a, a little bit more past that point, <laughs> But um, no, right. Anytime you're going to cast ten mana worth of spells on turn one, and that involves you know two draw engines, uh, I, I think you're in pretty good shape. And when it happens that early, 
and you're so ahead and you've got a value engine uh, that doesn't rely on what your opponents are doing, um, that's going to force everyone into having to play a little bit more aggressively into your heuristic study, which just kind of helps you spiral out of control and I think just win the game. <laughs> um, so I think to a large extent this was decided right then and there. And the only possible way, you know, this might not have happened would have been if, like, I don't know, specifically Alan drew into uh, Trinisphere. And, like, then maybe, <laughs> maybe this wouldn't have happened. Could could maybe holding up the cost of Caterpillar been the correct move, or was it fine for him to just go into the skull clamp. I mean, considering he was going turn zero, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I remember hearing spleen in that, in the game chat, uh, not being happy with that play. You know, I mean, it, it, could that have made a difference in the long run? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think if you do that, then you end up making it so that Ristic study only draws one card. Uh, but you set yourself back a lot in the process. Um, mm -hmm. and, I do feel like, you know, while in hindsight that would have been the better play, potentially, uh, Alan has a lot of outs in terms of more disruptive stacks pieces that he can draw into off of the um, the skull clamp. So I, I mm -hmm. understand why he took the line that he did, you know, because in theory you are going to find something a little bit better than just, like, you know, holding up the cost of Caterpillar uh, with the expectation that, like... It's going to be incredibly powerful. Um, you know, here it just so happens that it would have hit either the Mana Crypt or the Ristic Study, and both of those could have been very, very, um, you know, damaging to Rebel's ability to actually win this game. But it just kind of felt like it was Rebel's game to win no matter what they did. Like, even that line of play, I don't think necessarily wins them the game, just because, like, Rebel still has Tevesh Sot in play. Um, and is still ahead on mana if you hit the Ristic Study, or is ahead on cards if you hit the Mana Crypt. So, like, it's, you know, it's just a bad situation all around. Yeah, fair enough. Well, we are going to take a quick timeout. Um, say thank you to some of those uh, good old people who sponsor us. Um, well, not sponsor us directly. Um, but say thank you to some of those people, and uh, we'll be right back with game two of our uh, double header here on New Year's Day. Welcome back, everybody, to this special double header here on New Year's Day. This is the Mind Sculptors Gameplay Series. I'm Callahan, joined again uh, by my good friend Pongo. And Pongo, we just saw a not as fast as your game uh, when you uh, premiered on the Mind Sculptors Gameplay Series. Uh, but we saw one that certainly could rival it. Um, what was your take on that first game with Rebel? Um, it's better to be lucky than good, I suppose. <laughs> uh, she, she certainly had an incredibly great start. Um, and you know, we're going to see that deck in action here more. Um, so we're going to look here at these, uh, starting hands here and, uh, rebel, uh, is going to go first in turn order for this game. Then she's going to be followed by spleen face. Uh, then Cobblepot in last, unfortunately, is Alan. Uh, so, looking at Rebel's opening hand, her opening hand had Mana Crypt, Talisman of Creativity, Adnaz, Steam Vents, Gemstone Caverns, and Exotic Orchard. So, she mulliganed down to six, and uh, it, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, 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 would, I would think it's safe to assume that the Gemstone Caverns is a little bit of a rip here. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious about what she bottomed if she kept the gemstone caverns, but uh, I suppose we don't get the luxury of knowing that. Um, with this, I mean, this is a great hand. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Uh, this is, you know, what a lot of these Grixis and, and Sans Green decks want to see. It's either turn one Soul Ring or Mana Crypt and then a two mana rock and then, you know, a payoff of some kind. And Rebel kind of has it all all um you know with a caveat here uh you know a lot of fast mana and payoff in ad nauseum 
uh, which, you know, if you draw well, you're theoretically able to cast that on turn two. Um, although it's going to take a very particular draw here just because there's like two awkward parts of going first here. First is the gemstone caverns, not getting a luck counter on that. Uh, but then there's the fact that exotic orchard can't tap for mana. Um, <laughs> right. Although, you know, that's not actually a concern when your plan is basically just like land mana crypt talisman of creativity. Um, you know, what I kind of still expect to see rebel do is play that exotic orchard, even though it doesn't make mana, uh, the table probably laugh, has a good laugh about it. Um, and then, you know, you get mana crypt talisman of creativity coming down and then you really hope to hit like, um, like a dark ritual or something like a cabal ritual on turn two, uh, something that'll get you double black because right now we're, we're struggling on that front. Absolutely. Um, up next in the turn, or, turn order is Spleenface. He is going to have in his opening hand a Bloodstained Mire, a Lanoir Elves, an Arbor Elf, three visits, Court of Calling, Misty Rainforest, and Chromox. So he kept a seven card opening hand. And uh, how do you feel about this set? So this is like not an amazing hand, but in a lot of ways, it's the type of hand that I think you have to keep if you're playing Calmax. It's got a ton of mana, which is good because you're casting your your big chonky commander. Uh, but then, you know, the most important thing about this hand, and I think, you know, the reason why, like, Morgan probably would have snap kept it other than, like, all the mana is that you've got the Court of Calling, which is sort of the one-card combo with Calmax. So he's going to try to ramp into a pretty quick Calmax um, and also try to get a pretty quick Court of Calling and... You know, that's how he's going to try to take this game because it doesn't look like he's uh, got the tools to try to disrupt anybody here. Awesome. Uh, up next is Cobblepot on a seven card opening hand. He kept a Morphic Pool, an Overgrown Tomb, a Forbidden Orchard, a Blood Crypt, Training Grounds, Arbor Elf, and Mystic Remora. Uh, what are your thoughts on that set? Um, so there's a lot to like here, and there's some amount of stuff to to dislike. I think, you know, obviously, like, Mystic Remora is an incredibly powerful card, and you're happy to see that in a lot of opening hands, but the issue is that you're, like, very heavy on lands and very, very light on interaction, and this is the type of hand that I think really wants you to be able to, you know, ramp out quickly, get the Mystic Remora online, and, dis and, and have disruption. Um, to really like capitalize on the fact that you've got these, you know, Mystic Remora and, and secondarily training grounds as your grind engines. Uh, and without interaction, you know, you're really hoping that the rest of the table is going to help you get to that late game. Uh, right. You know, two of the decks here certainly aren't trying to win fast, but then there's one that is trying to win fast and is trying to be very greedy and also has counter magic to protect its wins. So, uh, you know, this is the type of hand that, you know, especially on a second seven, a lot of the times, maybe you keep it um, in this pod. It's a bit rough because, again, um, it, it's looking to play the long game and it's unclear if you're necessarily going to get that much time. Absolutely. Um, up next is Alan. Uh, he also kept a seven card hand. His seven was Ancient Tomb, Triskelion, Costa Caterpillar, a Shriek Maw, a Demonic Tutor, Buried Alive, or oh, and Overgrown Tomb. And uh, so what do you think of Alan's seven? Yeah, so there's a lot to like here. Um, you've, you've obviously got like the Costa Caterpillar that you can play out early, and this might be incredibly relevant, this game. I suppose we'll see, but, you know, alternatively... Um, or additionally, I should say, you, you, you've also just got like turn two buried alive um, and like demonic tutor to find a reanimation spell. Um, so, you know, if you find a black source somewhere in like your first two, potentially three draws, um, then, you know, you can make a pretty strong argument for winning on turn three with this type of hand. Interesting. Well, let's head on in and see how the game goes. Rebel is going to be going first for us. 
Um, so she's going to draw for turn here. And like we said, she's got quite a fast hand going to take two off of a steam vents. Mox okay. diamond. We got a mox top diamond deck. off the top. That's really, really good. Yeah, especially since that, that makes that gemstone uh, caverns good. Man, um, so we, we had an issue with the opening hand in that case. Yeah, I think it was a mana vault instead of a mana crypt then, it seems. Yes, okay. Yep, Talisman of Creativity comes down, and... The Talisman. Okay, no, we have multiple problems talisman. with the opening hand. Seems that way. I might have... I'll have to take a look at that. Wow, I wrote that down horrifically incorrect. <laughs> it was Mana Vault, Talisman of Creativity, Talisman of Dominance, Adnaz, Steam Vents, Gemstone, Caverns, and Exotic Orchard. I apologize. Hmm. That was very far off. Well, mistakes happen, but uh, here yeah. here we are, and uh, we're poised to cast an Adnaz on turn two. <laughs> Yes, we are. And uh, this Sweet is a, a little bit better than the already pretty reasonable hand that Rebel had. Yeah, uh, or thought we thought she had. I should say. Yeah, we thought she had. Yeah. Chromox from Spleen off after fetching the Tropical Island. He is pitching the Lanoir Elves. Yeah, we're gonna see three visits. Yep, three visits. And then we'll get the elf, and that's really, really explosive. Wow. That, that puts it... I forgot that puts it onto the battlefield. That gets an arbor elf. So, I mean, that's representing four mana on turn one. Yeah. So, I mean, this is what Morgan's plan is here, is to try to win quickly. Uh, and he doesn't really <laughs> have much other... <laughs> many, many other options with the hand that he kept. And an Arbor Elf from Cobblepot as well, off of the Overgrown Tomb. Overgrown Tomb from Alan into Caustic Caterpillar. This time, it does not die immediately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rebel will take a damage off the Talisman and play a Underground Sea. Now we get to see if... The Nas is in fact in hand or not, because <laughs> it, it might not be. We don't know. It, it was it was in the hand. I I can confirm that. I believe after the, I think maybe. Okay. Was so, I wrong? She is playing Tavesh. Yeah, the ad nauseum was in that opening hand. So the other thing you know that needs to be considered is that this is not necessarily the best main phase Nas deck. So it's right. certainly possible that what she's doing here is just setting up. Um, for a better Adnaz on uh, turn three. Makes sense. She does Tast Tavesh, which is a, a very cool artwork, by the way. Um, I believe this is the first time we've seen Tavesh on a card represented ever. Um, he's just been referenced, I believe, previously on like three cards. Something like that. Um, yeah. It's, it's a pretty cool looking card. I certainly would not have expected him to look like that. Kalamax is on the battlefield with a bloodstained mire uh, still held up. Yeah, let's hope, plays. That, uh, let's hope that some people drew into some interaction. <laughs> <laughs> Cobblepot plays a Morphic Pool and Morphic Pool and, and Morgan says right on right on time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is and you know, Sylvan Library from Cobblepot as well. One of those situations where if the turn order was different, uh, we would have a completely different game here. Very much so. Ancient Tomb for turn from Alan. All right, are we gonna get a maybe a maybe demonic? No, I mean I figure you probably buried alive first here. It's a little awkward to have the Triskelion in hand, I think. 
Yeah, Triskelion in the hand is one of the weird parts about that opening hand, I feel like, because that's a card that you usually want either in the bin or in your deck. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, Casting okay. the Demonic Tutor, That's you will have a color... Oh, no. Yeah, he does there's, have to feed the fish. There's a floating here. Correct. Um, so this is a little less mana efficient than doing the Buried Alive first. So... What I'm, would you be getting in this situation? Yeah, so it, that's an interesting question. So I'm I'm not intimately familiar with Alan's deck and the lines of play, so it's hard for me to say for sure. Um, with only one colorless available, no land drop available, um, I think it's unlike like it. Theoretically, you could go get like a Chromox here if your plan is to like subsequently use the cost of Caterpillar potentially to disrupt rebel um or you just ignore the threat that rebel poses here and you know you just like go for something that's going to let you discard triskelion so that you can bury it alive but then you still need the reanimation spell um you know like an interesting line that you theoretically could have taken here no, so that, that Triskelion in hand, if I'm understanding Alan's deck properly, is incredibly awkward for, like, multiple lines. Although... Yeah, it, it, it puts you on, I feel like, your Buried Align lines all include Walking Ballista. Oh, yeah, that that's fair, actually. With Walking Ballista, the Triskelion in hand, I think, doesn't actually matter. It's not where you want it to be, but I don't think it's... As, it, I don't think it's awful... But it's it's certainly it's yeah. certainly awkward, but it's not awful. It's not backbreaking for him. No, no. So yeah, all, all of your lines are still totally live here. It's true. Um, like the other thing, if, if you're not going for the buried alive line here, then in theory, you could have drawn into like a reanimation spell, and maybe you want to entomb, and then you have a plan to sacrifice your Hulk. Um, cause like I could have easily seen just going buried alive there and then going like demonic tutor into reanimation spell and mm -hmm. winning on turn three. If you found a land. We don't know what he found cause yeah. he didn't, he only had two lands correct in the, the opener. Right. But I, I feel like you can't tutor for a land here unless you found another tutor. Like... Yeah, that's 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 kind of a rough spot to be in, just because like people are getting so far ahead of you that I feel like you you do kind of want to win quickly, right? Because like, you're not going to win in a super super long game here. So Rebel is on her turn now, and so she does have three cards in hand. She did lose a life from the Mana Vault, so let's see what she kind of gets here. Are we seeing an ad nauseum here? No, tapping four. Reality scramble on a thrall. All right, all right. We're trying to we're <laughs> we're trying to empty out the hands and win the hard way. I I really like this this card. It is uh, featured in one of my favorite Pleasant Kenobi videos, where he uh, I, I believe I I you and I have watched this video. It's uh, a he calls it the the Tybalt glow up video. Yeah, <laughs> where he reality scrambles and legacy Tybalt's into like nickel boluses and Ugans and such. So I think there's a really funny parallel with this deck, which is like you you take an already kind of good successful deck, you know, in this case Turbo Nas in the Pleasant Kenobi case, um, you're talking about uh, um, Mono Red Prison, and then you kind of add like. Uh, a spicier line and I feel like in a lot of situations like it's the conventional lines that that get you there more than the spicier lines right unfortunately we certainly saw that with the pleasant Kenobi video and we saw that last game and 
It remains to be seen if we'll see it this game. Reality scramble. The reality, cool. the reality scramble got deflecting swatted, and uh, Morgan, <laughs> Morgan, changed the target from the thrall to her underground sea. Um, so right. she tapped We're it for a, a blue, floating a blue, and she's gonna go flip over a land. We're putting a land into play. And she's showing one blue floating with this. Uh, this was, I, I, I think, if I remember correctly from what I was told about this game, is there was a little bit of confusion about that, I remember hearing. Um, but she flips right over into a marsh flats. All right. She's going to sack that. Drawing into that deflecting swat was really nice. I think it goes without saying. Yeah, uh, you could argue that saves it, and she just replaced the yeah, underground like, sea off like the marsh flats. Back. <laughs> but uh, interestingly enough, you know, if you go for Adnaz there, while you are feeding the Mystic Remora a lot of cards, if you try to win that way, um, you're not you're not vulnerable to deflecting SWAT at least. True. Interestingly, it, it, yeah. Interestingly enough, deflecting SWAT. Deflecting SWAT is very flavorful in that Kalamax deck because it does feature Kalamax on the art of Deflecting SWAT. Yeah, I mean, it's a flavor win and just, you know, a win on the stack here. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, honestly, I don't know if Morgan can possibly win any more this game. <laughs> so she sacks a Thrall to Tevish, draws two cards plays a Misty for her land for turn. So it's interesting that the Marsh Flat does not count as a land drop because it was reality scrambled. Right. Um, I wonder if this means that Rebel has another land in hand because playing reality scrambled next turn is tempting anyway, right? Like, <laughs> you, absolutely. you can just do it again next turn. That's what's so interesting about that card is with the retraceability, it has sort of this inevitability to it where it's kind of always threatening to do its thing every turn, potentially. Yeah, as long as you have lands in hand, yeah. Yeah. Which is a little tough when you're playing 28 lands, but you do have two really powerful draw engines, so, you know, you can hopefully find some number of those 28 lands. So she gets a volcanic island off of the Misty Rainforest. She lets the blue... Um, roll out of her mana pool and she passes the turn and spleen is going to fetch on her end end step so we're probably getting a like tropical island steam vents well, yeah something like yeah that. we can't get a tropical island or so it has volcanic to be island excuse me yeah it yeah it wouldn't make sense to be a stomping ground here so i would expect a steam vents unless Morgan happens to have a one mana blue card uh, that he wants to cast like a brainstorm or a mystical tutor. But, you know, he would have had to have drawn into that in his first two draw steps. Right. And we already know he drew into deflecting SWAT. So, all right. He here's the probably tap, Steam Here we go. Steam Vents. That's very interesting. This is an interesting um, kind of CDH like what you fetch in in which order sort of rule um, is that generally if you're fetching on end step, you want to and you don't intend to use the card uh, to get your shocks first um, there instead of your duels, because then you don't lose the life off of the shock. Right. So, I mean, that that's equally true in modern as well, where exactly uh, a lot of the time, if you can, you you choose to fetch on your opponent's end step and get a shock to, well, a, sorry, a shock, a tapped shock land. You know, unless but, you're uh, unless you're Jund and you go turn one, you know, Misty Rainforest, Overgrown Tomb, Thoughtseize, and you're just, you, <laughs> I guess it's, you know, if, if you're playing Death Shadows. Right. This dockside is a side from dockside. Morgan. This is. Wow. A potentially game-winning Dockside right here. So that's four from Rebel, two from Cobble, none from Allen. So that is a six, six mana off of the Dockside. That is a, a really good uh, ritual. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, those those turn three Docksides making six mana are very strong. So... 
I expect Morgan is going to go for it here. You don't have to so feed the can... Mystic or more that many cards, and you have enough mana, and you can do this before combat. So let's see. Three, right, six, seven, eight. All right. There's the Court, there's of, the calling. court of Calling. And Calamax is going to double it. So what is the line here? So here we're getting, you know, Kiki Jiki plus Kiki Jiki bottom. Um, and because we're pre-combat, it's trivial. You can get any Kiki bottom you want. Um, now, nobody has any outlet in play, like a Thrasios or something like that. So this has to be done before combat. Um, if there's a Thrasios in play, then the in theory, you could do this post-combat with Coercive Recruiter, which is mm -hmm. one of the Kiki Bottoms that I know Morgan is playing. Um, but you can also just get a Corridor Monitor here. Uh, al although you're going to always get, I think, the Coercive Recruiter just because uh, it's like less vulnerable to certain types of removal, like a possible like Force of Vigor. Um, additionally, why not just get the five mana card when you can get two five mana cards? Right. So, he is not getting Kiki Jiki first, it sounds like. He's getting Dual Caster Mage first. Okay, Dual Caster Mage. I would assume that is going to copy the Chord of Calling. <laughs> yeah, that'll be another Chord, which is fine. Which will get Kiki Jiki. And then uh, okay. Kiki Jiki so then is going Kiki to copy Kiki, the Dual Caster. The Dual Caster, yep. So we can actually get multiple Kiki bottoms here. He said uh, in chat exactly. There's the course of recruiter. And that's going to ETB targeting Kiki Jiki. Uh, so that should untap it. Um, and then you... Yeah, so so yep. Kiki Jiki is now a pirate, notably. Um, you know, in case uh, <laughs> in case you ever wanted, in case that was like the cosplay you were thinking of, uh, going Kiki for Jiki. Kiki Jiki pirate. Uh, you know, we're we're seeing it live here. Um, so what that means is that every time you copy, essentially like any card, it will come into play as a pirate, um, and then it will untap. Yeah, because the way Course of Recruiter works is that uh, whenever Course of Recruiter or another pirate enters the battlefield under your control, gain control of target creature until end of turn, um, untap that creature, and it, it gains haste and becomes a pirate. Um, so basically, yeah, you're going to be able to start copying whatever you want, uh, and Kiki Jiki will just essentially untap every time. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, it looks like Spleenface takes that one. And uh, and so this is the Calamax deck that I believe when we were doing our Wedge episode, um, he was saying was really good and worth uh, talking about more. Um, so, you know, here as we're, we're seeing it unfold, we saw it unfold there. Um, Calamax certainly is a good card, it seems. Has a lot of potential with these Kiki Jiki combos. Yeah, um, I think that that is maybe not the most representative of the Kalamax deck just because like it's sort of more of a mid-range deck and not really mm -hmm. the type of deck that's going to consistently win on turn three just because like with the team your card pool, um, you're going to have trouble accessing those types of combos. Um, and like while the deck does play like a certain amount of redundancy, you know, sometimes it's going to struggle to like ramp fast enough to get Kalamax out. Uh, on turn two consistently such that you can win on turn three you know it's more of like a turn four deck uh as far as like winning is concerned and then like sometimes uh you know it might not even be able to get there on turn four just because of like difficulty accessing these pieces mm -hmm. um but you know dockside extortionist is essentially like time walk right like <laughs> uh it, it just sometimes like 
Sometimes it's just better than time walk because you get more mana than you actually had access to in terms of your lands and and dorks in play. So it's like you're taking right. an extra turn because you've essentially more than doubled your mana. Um, so yeah, you know, it's definitely going to get you there in a lot of situations where uh, you might not have been able to before. And that's exactly what we saw here. Like just drawing it to that Dockside Extortionist was so timely and so powerful. Yeah, Dockside Extortionist, uh, when it released uh, last year, um, well, I guess two years ago, now, uh, almost now, which is wild. It feels like it just came out. Um, it, it it has really done a lot to shape uh, what CEDH looks like and uh, a lot of these cards. And so we've really seen this uh, deck kind of come or these this card really come out and, uh, and change the, the, the way the format looks for sure. Oh, 100 percent. That's certainly the card I think that was most impactful within the last year and a bit or so absolutely well uh that about does it for us here in the studio uh any final thoughts here as we kind of wrap up this double header pongo um i was gonna say that you know these pods make like red look really good but <laughs> you know considering that like three out of the four decks uh each each game were red decks that that was certainly going to i think uh happen every single time um right that being said uh we you know we saw dockside extortionist be incredibly powerful uh in on in, in that last game and before that we saw um you know sort of in a many in many respects kind of like the black red turbo shell uh be extremely powerful um and you know while that's not while we didn't necessarily see dockside extortionist that game um you know we still saw kind of like what that whole archetype is trying to do um and you know like is just so much stronger for all the new red cards that we've gotten recently yeah absolutely well that about does it here for us uh i'm callahan that's pongo and again thank you all for uh joining us this week up next uh coming up next week uh we are going to have the fellows from play to win uh, on and it's going to be them versus us. So we'll see how that turns out. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.